2003, 100 years since Orwell was born in colonial India. So what does TV do? Biographical documentaries, of course. The first of these was George Orwell, A Life in Pictures, shown on BBC Two on the 11th of June. He was actually born on the 25th of June, but never mind. This was made by Chris Derlacher, whose idea was an ingenious one. There's no footage of George Orwell, no recordings of his voice, so why don't we just admit that from the very beginning and fake it? And so with various clever contrivances, that's what he does, but always using the words that Orwell actually did write. Down and Out in Paris and London, a publisher's promotional film. There is a feeling that is a great consolation in poverty. You have talked so often of going to the dogs, and, well, here are the dogs, and you've reached them. The Road to Wigan Pier, a film about going down a mine, which in reality draws on John Grierson's seminal documentary, Coalface. All of us really owe the comparative decency of our lives to poor drudges underground, blackened to the eyes, with their throats full of coal dust, driving their shovels forward with arms and belly muscles of steel. Here's 1942 essay, Pacifism and the War, in which he argued against pacifism. Well, they turned that into a studio discussion between him and the writer Derek Savage and Alex Comfort, then a poet and sexologist, well known when I was a lad for writing a non-fiction book, The Joy of Sex. Percussions. The idea that Human one can somehow remain aloof and from values. and superior to the struggle the corruption while living on food that British sailors have had to risk their lives to bring us is, is, is a bourgeois illusion based on security and money. I won't say much more because it's easily found on YouTube. Hundreds of thousands of people have watched it and uh, there's a clip of it that's him, it's supposedly him on Jura and his last warning to the world before he dies. Uh, saying don't let totalitarianism happen and uh, some of the people in the comments seem to think that it's, it's really him. If you want a picture of the future imagine a boot stamping on a human face. It's not him of course it's the comedy actor Chris Langham whom Derlacher felt very lucky to get because the bigger name actors wouldn't normally be involved in this kind of project. And the final result was garlanded with awards, including an international Emmy for Outstanding Arts Programme. What I most wanted was to turn political writing into an art. The following month, Melvin Bragg's ITV arts series, The South Bank Show, did a documentary on Orwell, presented by his biographer, David Taylor. I'm not going to say too much about that, because I'm concentrating here on the biopics, but I will say that they brought back... Ronald Pickup to play Orwell, if only in voiceover, reading out extracts of his work. And then in November you had another ITV documentary, this time on Scottish television, Orwell Against the Tide. This one was its radical left sympathies on its sleeve and the producer-director Mark Littlewood calls it a film about George Orwell from the freedom fighter perspective. It was funded in large part by continental European TV stations. Uh, a lot of it was shot in Spain because Littlewood recreates Orwell's experiences of the Spanish Civil War. I had come here to shoot at fascists, but a man who's holding up his trousers isn't a fascist. <laughs> He's visibly a fellow creature similar to yourself, and you don't feel like shooting him. And in between these recreations, you have interviews with those well known lefties, Richard Rorty and Noam Chomsky. Wherever the high are oppressing the low, there will be something that Orwell has diagnosed. Orwell is played by the Scottish actor John K. Steele, but the way it's shot, you don't actually see him speak. It's all done in voiceover. One of its scoops is an interview with Willibaldo Solano. I hope I haven't butchered his name too much. Uh, he was the Poom Youth General Secretary in 1937, and he remembers this writer who, in 1937, who was very dull and shy, or seemed that way at the time. While I'm on the subject of biographical films, I want to mention one from 1992 that is as much about H.G. Wells as it is about George Orwell. 
Paul Pender's play Beautiful Lies, which went out as part of BBC Scotland's Encounters series, told the story of a dinner party that Orwell hosted with his wife Eileen at their flat in St John's Wood, London in 1941. There were two other guests at this party. One was Wells, played in this case by Richard Todd, and the other was the poet William Empson. Orwell, played here by John Finch, had written an essay about his boyhood hero for Horizon magazine, Wells, Hitler and the World State, which Wells really took exception to, and it all follows on from there. It's a very good play, and in Pender's hands, Wells gets to say to Orwell, read my early work, you shit, um, which he never got to say to him face to face, but did say in a letter later on. I also like the bit where he confronts Eric Blair about his pen name, and it's along the lines of George Orwell. That, that's a bit close to uh, Herbert George Wells, isn't it? Anyway, that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe. Blah, blah, blah. Um, next week, I'll be talking about Shooting an Elephant, two versions of Shooting an Elephant that were released as short films in the 2010s. There's a man talking about an elephant attack. What? Attack by an elephant? Is he nuts? <laughs> <laughs>